other than the five senses, we can even cognize many things that is beyond the five senses. Yeah. And I'm, it's, we are in such a uh, beautiful and fortunate era where science is uh, shaking hands with the ancient science of wisdom. I hope they stop shaking hands and hug and kiss each other and make love <laughs> because we need more. We need yeah. more union it's, between them. It's a them. beginning, yeah. <laughs> it's a beginning. First to shake hands. First to shake hands. <laughs> I met a lot of spiritual teachers in my life, and there have been very few who have impressed me as much as Guru Dev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. Now, the idea of the guru is something that seems to be an idea of the past. It seems to be that the ideas are more important than the person who is conveying the ideas. But there's also something very special about a person who is conveying the ideas from a gnosis, from a place of truth within their heart, where it's not just the words they are expressing, but it's the energy behind the words that make them really land. And this podcast is a perfect example of that. I ask him the four basic questions to humanity, and his answers are profound in their elegance and their simplicity and the energy with which he delivers them. I can't wait to share this podcast with legit guru, Guru Dev Sri Sri Ravi Shankar. The truth is, is that we're all the master, we're all the healer, we're all the mystic. Give it up one time for Aubrey Marcus! So I'd just like to offer a little prayer, a little prayer that uh, these words and the energy behind these words, always more important than the words themselves, reach people in a way that brings them into greater peace and love, satisfaction, self-dignity, whatever they need at this time, may we be a vessel to offer them that warmth, that comfort, that clarity for the good of all. Lovely. Mm. <clears throat> All that beautiful prayer you said, they said it in one syllable, Om. Oh. Om means it's love, peace, mm. justice, clarity, serenity, beauty. <laughs> the creation sound of the divine. Yeah. Which carries the frequency of all of that. Correct. Yeah. Then the question can we say all of our words with the frequency of om mm -hmm. like if we can do that then every word changes from the meaning of the word the symbol to the actual truth that's behind it so we could speak gibberish but it would land in a different way yeah you don't need to even speak <laughs> your being your silence conveys yes yes that is one of the signatures that I've seen in people who I would look up to as a spiritual mentor, a spiritual master. It comes across in three things. One, an energy that you can feel. Two, a smile. <laughs> and three, a laughter. Yeah. Like if those three things are all, all in alignment, it really doesn't matter what they say. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yes because at the end if you don't get to the place of laughter you've no, gone you've made a wrong turn <laughs> it's nothing it's, it's useless <laughs> <laughs> i was i was taught in uh there's some lineage teachings of the deep jewish tradition and they teach that Paradox, the ability to hold paradox is one of the higher states of consciousness to Absolutely. be able to hold paradox. And that laughter is what allows us to hold paradox. And it's a natural outcome. When you hold a paradox, laughter is spontaneously there. Mm -hmm. You don't make an effort to laugh. <laughs> it just comes out. Yeah. <laughs> 
and it, it in that moment it it just reconciles the irreconcilable right because paradox is irreconcilable but when you laugh and you have that smile and the twinkle in your eyes like you have now it's just <laughs> oh yes here we are it indicates higher truths yeah for sure well there is a million things that we could talk about of course I wanted to go and try and stick to four basic questions, okay. and they're big questions. So okay. if we only make it to one of them, so be it. Okay. But the questions are, just to give us a map, who are we and what are we? Who and what are we? Where are we? Where are we? What is the nature of our world, of this reality, of the other realities we can touch? What is it that we really want? And what can we do? So those four questions. Okay. So we'll start with the first question. Yeah. Who are we? What are we? Well, this question is a million dollar question. Great. I would, uh, Ryan, do you have the suitcase? <laughs> Here we go. I, I would like to take it away from you. You should keep it. <laughs> you know, who am I is a question that itself is a sign of mature intellect. This question arising in us indicates we are maturing. Mm. Now, no need to be in a hurry to find the answer for it. Ah, yes. Because this very question is like a vehicle for you to go in what? And what I am not gets revealed by asking this question, who am I? Ah. So one who knows the answer will never give you. <laughs> <laughs> You know why? Because they want you to have this vehicle to go inward. Mm -hmm. This question itself will remove a lot of cobwebs, cobwebs around our mind. Mm -hmm. It'll clear the path for us to f explore who we really are. Yes. And yes. once you find it, then there is no more question. You'll say, oh. uh -huh. just a wow will come out of you. No verb, no other verbal jugglery that we, you know, yeah, yeah, struggle with. That's not there. Um, it seems that there's two paths that you could take to get there as you go in this inner exploration, which is a a great virtuous path, as you said. One is to figure out what you are not. Well, I am not that. Isn't that, can you say that like neti neti, like I am not that? I don't know if I'm using the right language. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not that. What am I? Well, I'm not that. Well, not entirely that, maybe a little bit that, but I'm not that. W what am I in that way? So there's the, the, I am not this way. And then there's the other way, which is, wait, I am that. I am, I am you. I am all of that. Correct. So there's almost two paths that you can take. It's Actually, I would say that these two paths are extension of each other. Mm -hmm. So first step is to say from being somebody to being nobody. Mm -hmm. And the second step is being nobody to being everybody. <laughs> you see, I am this, I am this, I am everything. Mm -hmm. But to explore that, the first step we have to take, that is say, I'm not my body, not just my body. I'm not just my emotions. I'm not just my thoughts. You see, but there's something more than that. See, because this is all changing. Mm -hmm. See, our body has changed so much. If you take a picture of uh, you 10 years back, you would see so much change. Mm -hmm. and, and 10 years later, we will all look different, right? So there is some things that are changing and there is something that is not changing in us. Mm -hmm. Because of which we are able to even identify the changes. So everything is changing totally. Then you can't even uh, have a reference point. You can't even notice the change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is something that is not changing. What is that something? That's where the whole secret lies. Mm -hmm. What is true is always true is an expression that I got from another teacher, mm. uh, Paul Selig. What is true is always true. And so what we're trying to find is what 
that part of us which is true and always true and that's the that's the quest because an, another way to look at it is you can say i am aubrey but really that aubrey is a that would mean i was static really what we should say is i am aubrey ing you are guru dev ing as you evolve into the guru dev process of evolution as i evolve into the aubrey process of evolution so that isn't entirely true because it's changing but what it what we are is is a process an, an evolution of self see i I'll can i can give you another uh, example see it's the same mississippi river very old river from millions of years the river is flowing mm-hmm. but every moment the water is new in it it's not old water so it's both mm-hmm. it's an ancient river but yet it is very new water new river Mm-hmm. For some time, pe- for people, sometimes it's very confusing. How can something be both old and new? <laughs> <laughs> and so you laugh. <laughs> yes. You see. Yes. The so sun is very old, but the uh, warmth that you are getting today, the sun rays today, is very new. Mm-hmm. It can't. You can't have uh, a stale sun rays. You can't bathe in a stale sun. Mm. So. This is ever new and yet very ancient. Mm-hmm. Similarly, there is something in us which is not changing at all, and there is many things in us that keeps changing. The two aspects in us: one that doesn't change, the Aubrey that doesn't change, and there is another Aubrey. keeps changing every moment mm. your ideas they change your emotions change your you know the ancient people have said it in another beautiful manner that they said that there are two birds sitting on a tree one is enjoying the fruit the other is just witnessing it <laughs> so those two yes. birds are inside you that obri one obri <laughs> yeah now there's an idea that i've been very fond of thinking which is includes all of this that we're talking but also makes the space for us having a unique soul so yes we are nobody and everybody but we're also uniquely ourself our own name in an evolutionary process that extends through this life and perhaps into other lives and we may have similar or different ideas of reincarnation but we are like a strand connected to the divine which is everything and nothing so we're a strand that connects there but that strand is unique and we have the unique opportunity yeah. to express the divine in our own uniqueness absolutely absolutely mm-hmm. that's it <laughs> everything is unique here mm-hmm. not just obri not just uh, you know me not just someone else even every flower that blooms here is very unique yeah you see it's like our thumb impress fingerprints it's very unique see no one can open your ipad without uh, <laughs> yeah you as you know so uniqueness is there yet there is something that is the same in all yeah common yeah in the world today there's energy ideas that try to reduce people and actually we do it in our own mind as well we reduce people to a function almost like in a prison system people don't have a name they have a number and it seems like there's an energy in the world that wants to control everybody by giving them a number reducing them to a function and to me that feels like a a violation of our unique spiritual actualization gifts potential who we really are to try and reduce us to something that is like a a machine when we're not we're an emanation of the divine <laughs> you know you know obri what i say some people may try this but it will never happen <laughs> <laughs> you cannot succeed yeah because nature has made us so unique and uh, you know any 
individual trying to change that or make us into a machine may appear to work for some time, but not in the long run. Right. I don't believe that it, right. they will succeed in doing so. <laughs> I love not only that you said that, but I love how you said that because your confidence means a lot. It's because what I feel from you is just a confidence in, in the God that is expressed through us and a, this smile like, yes, try to defeat God. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck in your efforts to defeat God. <laughs> you know, I often say God only should have to make uh, make it obvious that he's in control. <laughs> <laughs> So let's move. Let's move to the second question. The second question is, okay, we understand a little bit. And of course, this is a long inquiry to understand who we are, what we are, and a beautiful inquiry we should all take. Now, but where are we? What is this world filled with other people, filled with other beings, filled with where did it come from? Is there an origin story? Is what is the what is what is the place, and maybe even what is the story that we can tell I'm about where we are? I'm happy you are holding on to this question. You know, as a three-year-old boy, you must have asked this question. What is this? Yeah. Where do the clouds go? You know, every child comes up with the spirit of inquiry. Mm. What is all this? And this is the mother of scientific innovation. Mm -hmm. You see? What is this? Is science. Who am I? Is spirituality. <laughs> And they both go together, mm -hmm. knowing about oneself and knowing about the world around us. They're complementary. Unfortunately, people have misunderstood this whole thing. They think either or this. Either one of them you, you get into, you know. Right. We need to know about this world. That is the whole path of scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. How many stars are there? How many planets mm -hmm. are there? You know, ancient civilization, they did do this. You know, they had this spirit of inquiry. Mm -hmm. and thousands of years ago, they already predicted Jupiter has 12 moons <laughs> without any um, Hubble telescopes, you see. How did they do that? Yeah, uh, that is through intuitive awareness. Uh -huh. Go within and get the knowledge. Uh -huh. Which is actually something that science science now says that you can't do. But what you're saying is there's a broader awareness of scientific inquiry in which you can actually go inside yes, yes, to find yes. the truth. No, science, is, uh, science has started to recognize in the cognitive aspects of the brain, mm. of our mind, you know. Other than the five senses, we can even cognize many things that is beyond the five senses. Yeah. And um, it's, we are in such a a beautiful and fortunate era where science is uh, shaking hands with the ancient science of wisdom. I hope they stop shaking hands and hug and kiss each other and make love <laughs> because we need more. We need yeah. more union it's, between them. It's a them. beginning, yeah. <laughs> it's a beginning. First to shake hands. First to shake hands. <laughs> uh, is They're not that bold enough to hug yeah. still. <laughs> a little bit hesitation is there, but we have come a long way. I'm uh -huh. talking about, you know, 40 years back when I used to talk about meditation, spirituality, yoga. People thought it, it's not for common man. It's not for mainstream. It was somebody out there must be doing all these things. But today, I tell you, 2.5 billion people around the world are practicing meditation, yoga. Wow. That's a big number. Big Almost number. One, one third of the world's population. And same with food habits, people have recognized it's you need to eat healthy food. And then environment, I've been talking for 40 years, I said, we need to plant trees, we need to be more conscious about the environment. You know, 40 years back when I was talking about this, people thought it's weird. Mm -hmm. But today, almost every country has a ministry for environment. Mm -hmm. They have departed... 40 years back, it was not there. Mm -hmm. uh, Progress. Know, yeah, we need to sustain our planet. And so where we are, we need to honor this planet. You know, we have to 
take care of the soil, we have to take care of the water, we have to take care of the air. These are the things that we pollute, you know. We can't leave the planet in a, a broken down condition for the coming centuries. Mm. In many of the traditions that I study with in Peru, the Quechua traditions, they have an, what they would call an animistic belief about the environment. So they believe that the trees have a spirit and they can talk to the spirit of the trees, that the waters have a spirit. Yeah. You know, Sachamama, Waira Mama, all, you know, Pachamama, all of the different elements and aspects of nature and then the entire earth herself is a spirit that they can communicate with. Is that the same in, in your culture yes, and tradition? Yes, yes, yes. In yeah. India, same thing. Mm. In India, trees do have, there are angels in Eve for each trees. <laughs> and the trees are, have life. And even among the trees, there are uh, friendly trees or enemical trees. <laughs> you know, certain trees are very friendly uh -huh. and they plant those trees together. Yeah. So, um, plant kingdom is full of life. There's consciousness there. Yeah. And similarly, water also. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you are aware of uh, this fact that a gentleman, in uh, a scientist in Japan, has done research on water and see how water molecules have feelings. Mm -hmm. And they can absorb the feelings. So, water has life. Mm -hmm. In India, we do believe water uh, rivers are holy. Yeah. And and they have spirit, yeah. They have life. This is something you also find in, in many cultures who yeah. have arrived yeah. at the same conclusion that water can hold memory and it, and it stores information and transmits frequency just like it would transmit electricity. If can you it, like it, you don't it. want to drop your hair dryer in your bathtub, it's a very big problem <laughs> because obviously it it conducts electricity. Can it conducts the frequency, the memory of the frequency of what you're feeling or what the yeah, area yeah, is feeling. Yeah. yeah. It's there. I have seen uh, Aboriginal uh, traditions around the world. If you go to Canada, the Native um, Americans in uh, Canada, or you see the Native people, the Maoris in New Zealand or in Australia, mm -hmm. in India, there is such a striking similarity between all these cultures. Mm -hmm. So one can easily conclude at some point of time when they had no planes or no um, big base of transportation, still there was some sort of uh, unison in the cultures around the world. Yeah. Is there an origin story for the cosmos, for the earth that I think, I know there's a lot of mythology in the Hindu tradition and there's a lot of stories and I think stories are perhaps the best way to understand things. You don't make the stories necessarily literal, but the stories point to the truth get it, get about it. what, how this cosmos came about. Do you have, are there stories like that? that oh yeah, there are yeah. plenty of stories on that. But whenever people ask me an origin of something, I only ask one thing. Can you please tell me which is the beginning point of a tennis ball? <laughs> uh, then I'll no. answer that question. <laughs> That's my condition. I always put that. Uh -huh. Tell me what is the beginning point of a circle? <laughs> I would say if I had to answer that, if I was taking your inquiry seriously, I would say that it begins with an idea in the imagination of a consciousness. See, a circle, every point is a beginning and every point is an end. Uh -huh. So virtually there is no beginning, there is no end. Mm -hmm. You can't say tennis ball begins here and it ends there. Right. This is spherical thinking. You know, we are used to thinking here linearly. So we want everything to begin somewhere, end somewhere. Mm -hmm. But there is another way of thinking, this spherical thinking. Mm -hmm. The Oriental philosophy always uh, looked into this. Mm -hmm. They said, beginningless and endless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So it's all spherical. See, you look at the universe; it's all spherical. Mm -hmm. So you don't need to look for when it began. <laughs> you know, if you right. go to Hawaii and you see there a coconut tree there, and say, so where did the first coconut or <laughs> came about? You know, the middle of nowhere, and you have coconut trees there. Did it come from Kerala? Did it come from Indonesia? Off from California, you know, you can go on these uh, these hypotheses, which may not be true. See, mm -hmm. why not the nature put everything simultaneously in all the places? Mm. It's possibility. Mm -hmm. So this spherical thinking is something we need to look. Mm. Another example I'll, I'll, I would like to give. So you keep a beaker of water and you put a pen there. The pen appears to have bent, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So when this when did this optical illusion began? When you observed it. If you don't observe, still it is there. <laughs> right. So it is not something which has begun. An illusion is not something which had a beginning. Mm -hmm. It is an appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Appearance don't have a birth. This is what I'm saying. I do. And it, it, it breaks the way that we think about everything because we've thought about everything in our life linearly. Linear. <laughs> and you're inviting us into a mystical perspective in which we say, this is what is. Yeah. And this question of start and end is just the way that our brain is used to thinking about Very, things. But here is, here is an invitation to look at things differently and just say, ah, this is what is. Today, fortunately, the quantum physics, the quantum scientists have, uh, physicists have recognized this fact. You know, there is what is called spherical thinking, that energy uh, is there as energy. You don't need to say the energy originated from here because it has neither beginning nor end. It can neither be created nor be destroyed. Mm. Mm-hmm. It is just there. Mm -hmm. Through my crazy travel schedule, I have learned that I want to travel light and effective. And one of the best ways to do that is to travel with all of Onnit's instant collection. Alpha Brain Instant, New Mood Instant, Hydra Tech. It's super easy. All you do is you tear off the little strip here, you pour it in water, and you get the instant effects of these formulas that we worked on for a decade. Formulas that I don't want to leave home without that can help in the case of alpha brain, get you more focused, put you in this productive flow so you can get the shit done that you want to get done. And of course, new mood to help you relax, stay calm, stay centered. It's the great yin yang of the Onnit formulas. And of course, Hydratech, anytime you're sweating, working out hard, all of these are available on it.com slash Aubrey and you'll save 10%. Once again, that's on it.com slash Aubrey. Because I love stories and because I love myths and mythology and I love understanding the true meaning behind it, is there a particular myth or a story from your culture that illustrates something interesting or something that you enjoy sharing uh, just personally oh, about, is, about the cosmos? Just any story that oh, comes to mind. Oh, there is plenty of them. Plenty of them. And so many stories. I don't know which one I should just take it like that. Okay. Uh, the the Lord Vishnu, the create the maintainer of the universe, he is resting, and uh, from the wax of his ears came two demons and uh, he was fighting with them for thousands of years like he couldn't win over them then he uh, asked for help from the mother divine Kali? mother divine uh, yeah. so and she came and she relieved him from, uh, she finished these two demons and relieved him from that war and um, the, the victory came to him. Mm. This is a story. Now, the wax, the two demons, you should know this name of them. They are Madhu and Kaitab. That means uh, craving and aversion. 
<laughs> so your craving and aversion starts from your hearing. And if you keep fighting with them, you can never win over. <laughs> But what can win over is a higher power when more energy comes into you. When the awakening, the power of awakening comes within you, then cravings just drop, aversions just drop out of you. Hmm. Then you win over. Like this, there are many, many stories, you know. Yeah. And then this, and the two demons were uh, slain inside the water. Now, water means love. Water means love. Love. So only with love you can transcend both craving and aversion. Mm. So within the water, these two demons were destroyed, mm. but they couldn't be destroyed in the air. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't destroy them in the mind. You had to destroy them in the heart. In the heart. So cravings and aversions are uh, rid. Uh, are are you know? Mm. Yeah. What was the role of the What was the role of the Mother Divine? In that myth, yeah. Mother Divine with the energy, she uh, took the both the, the awakening, energy, wisdom, knowledge, uh -huh. and so when knowledge uh, came up, then the craving and aversion both with love, yeah, inside love they could be dissolved. Yeah, that's a great story. There's so much wisdom in so many stories, but if we don't stay patiently. And and understand them, and understand that water means love, and understand what this is. We won't get the real meaning behind them. Correct. See, apaha is a word that in Sanskrit that connotes both water and love. So, if some dear friend you call apta. Apta means my dear friend. Mm. So, apaha means water. <laughs> yeah. So, in a friendly manner, uh, or in the space of love. You can get over your cravings, your aversions, and your hatred, and all that negative feelings that you keep fighting with. Uh -huh. So it, this whole story here uh, indicates: don't fight with yourself, but just elevate yourself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? Bring more love Bring into, more love. into your life. Yeah. When we're talking about cravings and aversions, this goes to my next question, which is an exploration of. What is it that we really want? Because we'll chase our thrills, our riches, our pleasures, and we'll avoid our pains, our discomforts, and we'll chase validations. But it's not what we really want. If I go into a deeper inquiry, like, what do I really want? So when you're, you know, questioned with that inquiry about what people, what it is that people really want, what do we really want? Well, see, you are asking a very general question. <laughs> <laughs> it, you know, it depends on what stage of uh, evolution you are in. Uh -huh. If you ask a child what you want, he said, "I want a candy. <laughs> I want chocolate." <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. the one then. And you ask a teenager, "What do you want?" Oh, I want a friend, boyfriend, or girlfriend. Whatever you know, and you ask someone. Little older than I want a job. See, our wants, our chase for something goes on till you really realize, uh, you really come to this understanding. I'm much bigger than all these roles I'm playing. Mm. Then you start asking, "Who am I? What is the purpose of my life? Where am I going? Is this the world? Is just this? Is it? Is there anything more?" These sort of till you reach this inquiry, and once you get this, um, get to that stage, I tell you, rest becomes very easy. Your mm. seeking begins. The seeking begins. Then it's not too far away to find yourself. It's, that's a beautiful. It's a beautiful way to look at it. And also, there's another inquiry that I want to dig a little deeper in because the child may think that it wants chocolate, but what it wants more, what he or she wants more, is love, for sure. Because if you deny a child love, even as much chocolate as you give it, it will not be a happy child. Yeah, it yeah. will not be satisfied. No, this, 
love is the basic thing. Yeah. You see, uh, and love always takes pride in the old. See, our mind runs for something new. Mm. Our heart yearns for something old. Mm. You take pride in an old friend. <laughs> and you take pride in a new computer. <laughs> it's not the other way around, you see. Uh -huh. You don't say, I have an old computer and I have a new friend. <laughs> That's not anybody's... Uh, yeah, it's true. ...wanting that. So, nature of love is... Uh, to look for the old, that bonding. And I tell you, it is always there. And most of the conflict in the world today is between the mind and heart. Mm -hmm. While the mind wants latest thing, gadget, something new, something new, the heart always longs for uh, to be connected. As you said, see, you had the beautiful mandala here. You are interested in the ancient uh, Peru, Peruvian you know, mm -hmm. mythology, explore the meanings of it. This interest in humanity is that of the heart. Mm -hmm. And in life you need both. Science and spirituality. Yeah. And love is always there, but it is more than seeking, I would say, in giving you will find it more. It's the, almost the same. It's fit. My understanding of love is the moment you give it, it opens your heart to love and the receiving is automatic. As you give, you receive because an open heart is a bilateral gate. Love this is what many out. people don't understand. They right. keep craving for others' attention and love. But I tell them, you say, look, you start giving. And there is, there is a joy in getting, no doubt. But there is a greater joy in giving. Mm-hmm. The joy that we get in getting is an infant joy. But the joy in giving is a grandfather's joy. <laughs> grandmother's joy. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. And that that really indicates love. Yeah. Yeah. And demand destroys love. If we demand love, then we are destroying love. Because mm. then there's a compulsion from somebody else to give it to you. And then the compulsion means that they're not freely giving it of their own. No, free even will. if they're giving, when the more you, you when you start demanding, uh, then your spoon is dirty. You can't <laughs> have the soup that you want to have. Yeah, you know, in my I have an incredible relationship with my wife Vailana. She's over there watching, and one thing that we've recognized is. If we get into a disagreement or a conflict, which is very rare, you know, we have a, a really beautiful relationship where that doesn't happen often. But this, the resolution is if either one of us and both of us can find anything to love, even if it's our cats, if one of our cats come over and we're having a disagreement and we love the cat, then our heart opens back up. And then it's easy to love each other again. <laughs> it's like the moment we open to love specifically, we can open to love universally, which includes returning love back to our own field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would go one step ahead and say, you know, arguments and fights are part of love. <laughs> 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 it should be considered as part of love. Yeah. Do you know? Like you have sometimes you put Tabasco in your... <laughs> it's a little spice. So it's a little spicy and that makes life more interesting. A little interesting. caliente. Yeah. <laughs> it makes life more interesting. You can't only drink Tabasco like you drink water, <laughs> yeah, but a course. little bit, yeah. yeah. A little bit of it is good. So, in, in you know, in life, we must see love is not just an emotion. <laughs> it's our very being. Mm -hmm. when it is of a very nature you can never get rid of it hmm. so that I see that not one being on the planet is there without love hmm. only that gets shrouded uh, it gets covered mm -hmm. it's covered by stress and misunderstanding and small mindedness lack of vision all these things come as a barrier 
See, even in the worst criminal, you will see that there is a child hiding inside that person, waiting to be unveiled. And, uh, you know, love is our very nature. It's not just an emotion that we... And if there is a disagreement between two persons, I would say you take turns. Don't <laughs> do it on the same day. <laughs> it means the husband or wife one give turn for one to flare up and you keep down. <laughs> and next day you can take your turn. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's uh, this understanding that our very nature is love is not a new understanding for me. It's something that many teachers have taught and that I believe. Mm. But when I hear something and and you express it in a way where I feel the truth of it, and then what happens in me is I the tears often come as a as a way to wash away my own disbelief in all the ways that I'd actually, even though I thought I believed it, I didn't really believe it. And then truth comes and it's like, I have to wash away this lens of perception that has been perceiving the world differently. And uh, No, no, no. It's a sign of love. Yeah. When heart opens, tears flow. <laughs> yeah. And doubts disappear. Mm. The ancient uh, rishis of India have said, when you, um, when, when you encounter the truth, you know, the doubts disappear. Mm. And the heart opens, tears flow. These are all part of the process. Yeah. So there is, uh, there is no dirt to wash it away. You are <laughs> already pure. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. The, the, the fourth question is, and then we'll explore some different other areas, but understanding all of this, understanding all of this, the world is in an interesting time right now. What can we do to help the world right now? I wish this question comes up in every mind. At least half the population, when they get this, what can we do? We'll, we'll be out of the selfish shell that we uh, reel in and, not, and be sen insensitive to others around us, you know. What can we do? This question must arise. As I said, the first question should arise. Who am I? Mm -hmm. This is very important. This is uh, the very beginning of our community life. What we can do to make life better. How we can save the planet. You know, mm -hmm. How we can contribute to the growth of... Uh, spiritual awareness, awakening peop in people around us. These questions may have many, many answers. Mm. I would say the first is we have to envision, think of a violence-free and stress-free society. If I look back and see 40 years back, what was America and what it is today, it is appalling. So mm -hmm. many people are committing suicide. Mm -hmm. This year, 400 medical professional doctors have committed suicide. And every day, 27 veterans are committing suicide. I mean, this was never heard of before. Mm -hmm. People who are supposed to save others' life are taking away their own life. Mm -hmm. Means there is a serious need for spiritual upliftment, mm -hmm. our wisdom, knowledge. You know, when our prana, the chi energy shrinks, that is when we want to get out of the body. Mm. Like you, if your jacket, if this jacket is too tight, what is your natural tendency? Take it off. I want to take it off. So when our subtle body, our subtle mind shrinks, our energy shrinks, then you feel depressed and it shrinks more, you feel suicidal. Mm -hmm. Now, what to do to make it come to its normal position? Breathing exercise. Yes. Yes. See, when you do breathing exercise, what happens? Your energy expands. And you might have noticed, whenever you are happy, what is the sensation you get? Not that of shrinking. 
Expansion, yeah. Expansion. Something in you is expanding. Hmm. Right? And can you keep it expanded? I tell you, yes, you can. Hmm. Meditation and breathing, the Sudarshan Kriya is such a powerful technique, breathing technique that we teach, the sky technique. It helps one to expand one's energy. Mm. And then this tendency to uh, commit harm to oneself or to others disappear. Yeah. You know, today what is happening is there is so much of aggression in the society. You saw just uh, three days back, some a gentleman comes in the grocery store and shoots down ten people, and we don't want to leave such a world to our coming generation. Nor do we want to live in such a world sure. where we live with such insecurity. You know, you feel so insecure to send the kids to the school. Yeah, feel so insecure to go to grocery store. You feel insecure to walk in the streets. This is not the world that we should leave behind. Right. We all must focus in creating a violence-free world. For that, we need to create a stress-free world. At least we should know how to get rid of stress when it comes on to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, today, uh, stress is a common thing. It, stress is competing with God. It's become omnipresent. <laughs> you see everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, we had to cut it to the size, you know. We had, we can't have the population go in uh, such depression. Yeah. We can't keep. We can't keep. We can't continue on this continue path. Continue like this. The I mentioned that I you know I study with uh, Quechua teachers from Peru, and one of my teachers, Maestro Orlando, in the Quechua tradition, he says the number one condition he is helping people with is stress. All of the people that he sees from the West, it's stress. It's the number one Brilliant. thing that is that he notices that people feel. Brilliant. And when you mentioned also breathing, you know, breathing is breathing practices are a big part of my life as well. And so many times in the deeper breathing, when you're really bringing in a lot of prana, tears come. And it is in your understanding of tears as you expressed it, it is my heart opening. Heart opening. It's the heart opening. And then as the heart opens and I realize myself in the expanded state, then the tears the tears flow. Yes, flow. And when you're very happy, also tears come. Yeah. Yeah. The heart again, it's the expansion heart process. Open, heart open. So what we need to look at uh, the things that we need to do is to create a stress free, violence free society disease-free body. And the third is um, inhibition-free intellect. Mm. We have all sorts of inhibition about religion, race, gender, gender, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, all this age and so social status. All this type of barriers we create in our mind between us and the others, that should be done away with. Hmm. <laughs> so I say, um, the whole world is one family, one mm -hmm. human family. Mm -hmm. And if we keep that as a goal in societal life and help others in whatever manner, however we can, uh, to uplift the spirit, you see, mm -hmm. we'll be doing the right thing, I, I, I suppose, I guess. Mm. You know, because we want to give a better world to the coming generation. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah. Do you feel that there are forces, people, energy that is trying to do the opposite? When you look out at the world, because obviously this is this is something that just makes sense. It makes sense. But and I wonder if it's just ignorance, and I don't know the answer to this question. If it's just ignorance, people don't know any better, they're confused, or whether there are certain forces or people who are actively working against peace and happiness and freedom and you know the release of inhibition of the mind. Do you see the world in a way that there's an opposing force or is there just general ignorance? I would say a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. 
there are forces who are very selfish who and that again of uh, ignorance you can't say right. anybody does any harm to others uh, and they are knowledgeable they are not yeah yeah it's true it's ignorance i would say actually is the only cause on the other side you can say we have not educated our population how to handle the mind yeah. we have not educated we have taught them dental hygiene but not mental hygiene <laughs> how to keep your mind free from inhibition how to keep uh, keep your spirit high we have not learned about it no techniques were taught sermons were given oh love thy neighbor help everybody and we have done so much sermons from all traditions we have heard but nothing concrete practical for people to do <laughs> right and that's how people really learn yeah. you do it yeah yeah this is what is needed you know education in mental health or even mental health itself is a sort of taboo i would say education in well being mm-hmm. to learn about the seven layers of our existence about our body little bit about our body our breath our mind our intellect our memory our ego and something that transcends our ego the self well with knowledge about all these seven layers of our existence can just make our life so much better so mm-hmm. much better i tell you mm-hmm. yeah you come from a culture that has had this wisdom for thousands of years in america for example we were founded by protestants and very strictly religious you know who wanted to escape england and and form their own religion and so we don't have a a rich tradition or history in the in the self exploration of the mind we were told to believe everything that somebody else wrote 2000 years ago or in that case 1600 years ago or whatever but in your culture this wisdom has been around and in many other cultures the wisdom has been there and in the native american traditions but what is it what is it that is that is still maybe so attractive about the new ideas of culture that have people forgetting you, you, the old ideas you see the do things have been in different cultures it's not necessary that people have adopted it or paid attention to it you see see i see every part of this planet has its own uniqueness mhm and nature has bestowed science you know so much scientific discovery has come up in america like nowhere else mm-hmm. and it has benefited the whole world mm-hmm. similarly ancient wisdom has always uh, come from the east mm-hmm. and that can benefit the whole world yoga's origin was no doubt in india but till recently not everybody was doing yoga you know mm-hmm. though its origins were there it was in books hardly people were doing <laughs> only in recent times the people have recognized and realized it's important to do that yeah so always you take it for granted you know you have something at home you just say okay yeah, my grandfather did it and that's okay you know i don't <laughs> need to do that <laughs> that type of mindset comes yeah i have a question here see when you can accept food from every part of the world you accept technology from every part of the world doesn't matter where uh, technology for cars have done if it's a car from japan we accept it if it's from germany we take it right mm-hmm. similarly danish cookies well <laughs> delicious and swiss chocolates delicious people love it yes you see when you can accept uh, food from everywhere music from everywhere beethoven is from germany but the whole world enjoys beethoven's uh, mm-hmm. music sitar is from india pandit ravi shankar mind same name yeah <laughs> <laughs> the sitar is uh, popular everywhere in the world yeah so why not we accept wisdom also why do we shy from wisdom right see just just by eating danish cookies you will not become um, scandinavian <laughs> you'll continue to be american mm-hmm. in the same way whatever faith religion you follow doesn't matter but you can 
benefit from all the wisdom in the world and own it, I say. I say. Mm. Don't think that, oh, Buddha was from India and Buddhism is only for India. No. Mm. Wisdom is universal. Jesus was, was from Jerusalem. That doesn't mean it's only for <laughs> Jerusalem. You know, right. from for Israel, or the whole world has accepted uh, his teaching. Similarly, Lord Krishna was from India, no doubt, but the Bhagavad Gita, Einstein has recognized Gita as one of the life-changing texts that he he read. That you know, mm -hmm. for Einstein, Gita was a very uh, big turning point in his life. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve Jobs has benefited from the Vedanta philosophy. So. The world over people, wise people, they always own all the wisdom. Yeah. They don't see it, it is my culture or someone else's culture. It's all ours. We have one planet Earth and all the diversity, cultures all belong to us. Yeah. This ownership can make us a global citizen. Mm -hmm. I cannot agree with you more. I think it's so important to be able to share, as you said, not just food or music or clothes or technology, but to share the wisdom and the medicine. Yes. And people will actually get angry, though, is the problem is they'll get angry if you're experiencing a culture's medicine that's not your own. For example, I, I really appreciate dance and the ecstatic expression of dance, the ability to dance to music, to drums, and feel that. Well, that's in many different cultures. But so, and so in a, in a certain gathering, we painted our own bodies and faces however we wanted to, inspiration from the elements, yeah. didn't copy anybody. We painted our faces and we danced. And people were saying, you can't do that. You're an American. You can't paint your face and dance. And I said, what do you mean? This is a human right. It's a human right yeah, to yeah. paint your body and dance to the drums and pray to the elements. Like if we make that only for this culture or that culture, then we're lost because the world needs all of the medicine of the whole world yeah, and all of the practices of the whole world. If yoga was only available for people in India, we're fucked. It's, it's, it's a big problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's exactly... We must own the whole planet. Mm. And honor all of the cultures and have yeah. reverence from whence they came yeah. and gratitude. Yeah. You know, gratitude is is actually the key aspect. Like, thank you yes. for holding this tradition. Yeah. Thank you for showing us the way. Absolutely. You, know? you don't need to do everything yourself, but it's it's necessary to have that sense of uh, belongingness and uh, gratitude, as you said. Mm -hmm. honoring each other, respecting each other, mm -hmm. respecting traditions. That's necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Peace is something that you are creating a movement to stand for peace. And understanding a bit of it, it's about creating peace within yourself, a field of peace within the self. See, after two years of pandemic on top of this war and then all this uh, inflation, there is a sense of uh, despondency in people. I feel so hopeless. You know, when you feel so hopeless, you start going down the hill. You know, you feel more depressed, more depressed. I wanted to stir people's energy up and then make them realize, yeah, we can do something. If we... Put all of our intention in one line. I stand for peace. Mm. Of course, we all stand for peace. We all know. But when we invoke that uh, conviction from within us, we will we can get over our sense of hopelessness, our helplessness. Mm. So, and collective intention from so many of us will definitely have an impact on the world consciousness. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the reason I'm now touring U.S., mm -hmm. <laughs> going from city to city and having everyone sit down and stand up for peace. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sit down and sit down and go within and <laughs> meditate, and then you stand up for peace. Yeah, yeah. Stand for something that's important. Another 
interesting question that I have is there are many gods and goddesses represented in Indian culture. When you connect with one of those gods or goddesses, it seems like there's it's it's more of an it's an energy. It's an energy that's represented by a form. Got it. And so if if somebody wants to go and interact with that energy of Shiva or Kali or Vishnu or Krishna or what is what is the way that you recommend that people try to connect with that energy to feel what it is? You know, um, like the white light has all different colors, right? So you choose to pick one color, red, yellow, blue, green, orange, whatever, and violet, but they all ultimately reach only the Mm-hmm. One light. Mm-hmm. So that's what in in, in India it said, Ekam Satvipra, only one truth, one divinity, but man- manifested in many forms. Mm-hmm. So you know, it's same wheat, you make pasta out of it, you make samosa out of it, you make bread <laughs> out of it, yeah. you make bagel, you make a muffin out I'm of it. I'm getting hungry with all of your analogies <laughs> of food. Is it is it lunchtime? <laughs> <laughs> So, like that, you know, in the varieties. So, in one, any one form of uh, divinity you take, these are devas, you take, and then you see all the other devas are also part of that. Mm -hmm. You take Devi and Shiva is part of Devi, Vishnu, everybody, uh, every other divine are associated with that one. Mm. So, it is your choice. That's why it's called Ishta Deva. Ishta Deva, your choice, choice of uh, worship. Mm. So if you like Shiva, fine, that's your Ishta, your, your liking, mm-hmm. you know. And form of Shiva also you can choose. You want to, you like dance, then you see the dancing Shiva. Mm-hmm. You want to see the meditating Shiva, then there is meditating Shiva. <laughs> so similarly, if you are... Um, lover of Mother Divine, then she has many forms. Mm-hmm. Very gentle form in the form of music. and The, the goddess of music, you know, she sits, sits on a stone or a white lotus. Is this Saraswati? Saraswati. And she has three things. One is a rosary and a book and an instrument, Veda. So that is sound, music, Book, logic, and then meditation, the rosary. Mm-hmm. These three things together make Saraswati. Mm-hmm. So like this, you know, it's both symbolic, also energy level, both. The best way is chanting, listening to those chanting and sitting and meditating. Mm. And different chantings have those specific definite vibrations, I tell you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it changes your... Changes your consciousness. Yeah, it, it brings a different flavor in your consciousness. Uh-huh. Yeah. Like you go to an ice cream parlor and there is all <laughs> different flavors, you know, strawberry and this and that. And uh-huh. Like that, they are all different flavors in the consciousness. Right. And we're almost finished here. And you've, if you talk one more time about food, I'm just going to walk out and go to lunch. <laughs> I think that's the idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're steering us gently towards towards lunch here. Absolutely. All right, so you I'll, I'll you let, got it. You're right. <laughs> so I'll let this be the final question. Is There's something of a paradox that I believe has been taught, which is Atman is Brahman, Brahman is Atman. The Godhead within is the same as the Godhead without. And that's sometimes difficult to understand how that could be possible. How is my God that's within me the same as this whole world universe God? Tell you a simple thing. Are you breathing? You have air inside of you? Do you see this is my air? Can you hold on to it? <laughs> yeah. The air which you have, you are ex- excelling. That air goes all around the world, my dear. Mm. You can't, div- the subtle you go, you can't create division. You mm. can create division in the body, or oh, that body is here, this body is here. 
but you go little subtler in the breath level. Can you say, this is my air, I'm just <laughs> going to hold on to myself. <laughs> no, the air that gets into your lung goes all over the world. The sun that is there is shared by everybody. Though same sun comes into your window, 100%, right? When you see a sun ray coming into your window, mm -hmm. it's not just half or one part of it. You find the whole sun. Mm. The total sun is in every ray. Mm. In the same way, the air around us, you can't divide. You go subtler the space. You cannot say, this is my space. Mm. You move from this room to next room, the space has changed. Mm. And yet it has not changed. So, Atman is the individual impressions. The, the, the air in a balloon is the same air that is outside the balloon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the balloon <laughs> and the air. Yeah. And so you must see um, beyond the, the cover of the balloon. Mm. And if you identify more with the air inside, you say, yeah. It is the same air outside and inside. Mm -hmm. It's the same space which is inside the pot and outside the pot. Mm -hmm. So it, it all comes to that oneness. Atoms, whether it is an atom from wood or brick or a metal or water or our body, it's all same. You know, here physics helps will help in uh, understanding Vedanta very well. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It says, the table is not the chair and chair is not the door on one level. They are all different. But on another level, it's all wood. Mm. So in that sense, it is one. And it's all light, ultimately, as well. Another way to look at it. Huh. Well, this conversation has been sp spectacular, not just for the words, but for the energy. You know, thank you for holding the wisdom and the embodiment of that wisdom. It's a very special thing, and I feel very honored to have had this conversation and to be able to share it. So, welcome, thank you for my welcome. Heart. Nice. Yeah, nice, let's you. go have some lunch. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks for tuning into this episode, everyone. As you may have heard on my last podcast with Charles Eisenstein, we are transitioning Fit for Service into a donation-based model. There are a lot of challenges with flipping the tables on the economics of how things have been. We're still figuring all of that out. But thank you for being a part of this journey as we sort out how to lead business and economics into this new world that we're all building together. I love you guys very much. Thanks for all your support. Thanks for tuning in, the likes, the comments, the shares. It all means a lot. I'll see you next week.